Yes, this is being recorded. This is Dr. Babo uh, doing my book talk on a good friend of mine, David Han. Well, let's start with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, let this book talk be inspirational and informational so that people could actually see the glimpse of you uh, in the creation narratives, Lord, of the Bible but how each nation, each ethnos uh, have experienced you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I would like to do a PowerPoint presentation with you. So hopefully uh, <clears throat> this will be recorded. Okay. Well, I, I thought... This was really interesting book. Um, it's one of those rare books that a good friend wrote. Uh, he's, he and I have been friends for oh, close to 30 years. And recently, on the seventh day of my El Norte solo motorcycle tour, uh, May 22nd, I was at his place. Uh, we both finished our doctorate at Oxford Center for Mission Studies. Middlesex University of England. We're celebrating it together, uh, completing one part of our journey as a followers of Christ. Well, he wrote an interesting PhD, and although we talked about it, I really didn't get to uh, expand on it or really learn from him until I bought this book. Uh, this is his second book series of his PhD. So it's a second book, Origin, Myth, and Indigenous Appropriation of Christianity, New Chanult Study, New Chanult Study. He uh, published it May 13, 2021, and he's now selling at 25 bucks. I thought, why? So expensive. But uh, after reading it, I said, okay, it's worth the investment. Because I have Amazon Prime, I didn't at least have to pay for delivery. So that was good. I got it actually same time that he got it as an author. And just a little thing about New Chanut. Uh, it's the area that I was visiting, actually. I was at Olympia, Seattle. Um, and it would be that area. So he, had a, he lived there almost 20 years with his people. If you read it historically, uh, the... James Cook uh, encountered the village 1778. And what was really shocking is that their population base, uh, only 4,600, 2016, which is like, wow, how could it be? Um, well, it's because uh, they were all killed by encountering Europeans with malaria and smallpox which is pretty tragic. Uh, their culture remains, and of course, uh, their culture is not. Beautiful ones are all over the world. And this one, this beautiful mask is at Berlin, Germany, Ethnological Museum. It's like mask with movable wings. Wow, how pretty is that, right? It's like butterfly. Uh, they were, I guess, warriors. Uh, they were whaling, I mean, a small boat. Try to catch whale in that boat it takes courage. Um, and there are a lot of stories. Uh, one of the uh, interesting study that I read on York University, it's a master level thesis. But this person also talks about the narration. The, uh, the whole book is infringes on the the son of Raven capturing the day. Wow, I thought it was really interesting. Uh, the Canadian Encyclopedia also talks about the origin stories as the Raven wanted the light and attempt different method to trying to release it. It's their version of creation narratives. So let's get to the book itself. Uh, and I really wanna challenge uh, my Phnom Penh Royal University uh, students, philosophy students, to listen and see how uh, 
you could also interject uh, Cambodian creation narratives, if there is such thing. You know, um, this book was published recently, 2021, May, and it talks about a lot of stuff, but I think I will do injustice if I do not read this story verbatim. It's the story of the how Son of Raven captured the day. It's the key story. And there is other versions of that uh, uh, in different tribes of that area, or as a raven steals the light, raven steals the sun, how raven stole the sun. So four different way in which he was told. But in the tradition of Nuchanu tribes, this is how it was told. Okay. I'm just gonna read and so that you don't have to read this book, but get the narrative, the story from its original context. How Son of Raven captured the day. They had no light in the beginning. Son of Raven suggests that they try to capture the day across the waters, a chief on the light of the day, which he kept carefully guarded in a box. The people who lived in the darkness grew tired of this and wonder what to do. How can we do that? He asked, he was asked. We will entertain the chief with a dance. Son of deer who cannot only run fast but also leap far will dance. If we are to capture the day, deer must dance as one who is inspired, as one who captivate an audience. And then what will happen? They asked Son of Raven. Deer will have soft, dry cedar bark tied behind him when no one seems to expect it. He will dance close to the day box and dip this bark into the fire. Yes, that's a good idea, they said. All was now prepared. Every exacting of trial ceremony and practice had been observed. Son of Deer was dressed in his finest dancing custom and the soft dry cedar bark was now carefully tied behind him. When they reached the other side, they, the dancing began. The chief and his people watched. And what happens is that the, the deer sets the thing on fire, but before he could take the box away, they were captured. And day box would be more closely guarded. And people lived in darkness, regrouped and said, go and get Warren, Rian, the wise one, son of Raven said. And, and, and Rian, the wise one said that, well, this is what we're gonna do. We're going to basically turn ourselves into uh, sockeye salmon and go near uh, the chief's daughters and capture them. And it didn't work because the son of Raven became a giant king salmon and that kind of spoiled the plan. And finally they said, well, what about, why don't you turn yourself into a tiny leaf so the daughters of chief could drink you? And then what happens? Well, she drank deeply and one tiny leaf drifted toward her mouth before she could stop. She had swallowed it. Oh, well, it's only a tiny leaf. But not long after this, the daughter became pregnant. She wondered how it could have happened for she had no husband. In due time, she bore a son. It was crybaby. <laughs> and this crybaby, cry, cry, cry. Let me play with this box. Gradually, family began to trust him, and the, the day box in his canoe, and then he ran away with the canoe. With day box in his canoe, the boy was especially careful since he was closely watched. However, the boy did nothing unusual. He appeared con content and happy simply to have the day box in his canoe while he played. Grandmother was happy. Mother was happy. The, incessant crying and whining has stopped. And then finally, 
Meanwhile, among those who live in the darkness, Ren has sent some mice on the important mission across the waters to the shores of the chief who owned the light of the day. During the night, the mice ate the holes in one of all of the canoes except the one belonging to the boy. The next morning, boy began to play with the day box again. He was being watched, but not closely anymore. Then all of a sudden, the boy gave a might thrust and his mother's paddle swiftly canoe raced over to mother's over the water toward the other shore. The chief and his people panicked. They scrambled for their canoe. One by one, as canoes were launched into deep, they sank. The mice had done a good job. As the boy neared the other shore, he began to uncover the day box carefully, slowly. Now, for the first time, the people of darkness experienced the daylight. They looked and saw that it was a son of Raven who was coming to bring them the light. It grew bright and brighter until fullness of day was upon them. Wow, what an interesting story. Um, well, he turned, um, he explains, David, my friend, this local mythology as a narrative, creation narratives. Um, and they're really interesting. A lot of uh, comparison we could make. Especially, he asked a metaphysical meaning of this metaphorical story. And this is where I think my philosopher friends in Cambodia could help, really. Um, and ask, what does it mean for Cambodians? Well, he asked first, uh, it raised question whether the analogy came from the influence of the Christian story, since at the first hand, there was a notable similarity with Hebrew creation story of Old Testament scripture, like in the beginning, right? It's in page 63 of this book. Second, the metaphorical theme of darkness and light appear in many world religions, especially in Christianity. A question to ask about the theme darkness appeared in New Channel, creation myth was whether darkness and light point to metaphysical view. This is interesting point, guys. Listen, convincingly, the tomb, darkness, seemed no known metaphysical meaning. The sample example, for example, compared to physical absence of something is not, uh, light is not darkness. Okay, let's park our thought there for a second, drink some hot water, and process that. Hmm. What does that mean? So he's asking a metaphysical question and the absence of light is it necessarily darkness. Remember, as we we're studying about Martin Heidegger, uh, we were talking about his absence of something necessarily nothing. So asking the same question. Right? Looking at the sample sentence, the language habits of New Channel did not appear to use the word tomb, darkness, as a metaphysical meaning. It's beyond that, right? And so, because it's come from the two different world. Furthermore, in the story, world where chief and his family live appear superior to the dark world. Almost all myths deal with the existence of two worlds before creation, sacred and profane. While the traditional indigenous belief do not accept the Cartesian duality, there was a clear distinction between the two worlds, the world, the chief and his family and the dark world. Chuck Kraft or Charles Kraft or Fuller explains, page 67, that worldview was culturally structured assumption, values and commitment underlying people's perception of reality. Okay, hmm. What does that mean? See, uh, Chuck Kraft is anthropologist who was teaching at Fuller Theological Seminary uh, it was interesting how at the same period, 1986, around that time, 1986, 87, I took class by Chuck Kraft and class by uh, Princetonian theologian of the New Testament. 
uh, I wrote two papers and my New Testament paper was graded B. And there was three categories and he gave me B because I got A in theological insight, gave me C on English grammar, therefore B overall grade. I thought, I went to him, I said, sir, shouldn't I just be graded for my theological death? Why do you care about English grammar? It's not an English class, it is a theological class. He said, oh no, you should check your grammar. Grammar is important I said, to you, not to me. And uh, at the same time, I took a class by Chuck Kraft. Of course, I wrote a paper, I got an A. <laughs> I'm using the same grammar. Matter of fact, in my paper, he circled all this funky grammar and wrote, I love your creative grammar. Why? Because he is not giving American grammar absolution, right? He did not use American grammar as a ruler to downgrade my paper because I do not subscribe to their order of things because grammars change, uh, uh, spelling change. So if American scholarly paper were measured by English, England grammar, they'll be all downgraded. And they say, oh, stop speaking American. Why don't you write English? That's what they will say, if they use the same principle. But there's no absolution. So I love the way that he claims that worldview was culturally structured assumption. It is an assumption of values and commitment underlying people's perception of reality. So to this new channel people, absence of darkness is not light, it's two different reality. But we tend to consider the Western people consider Western category of non-Western worldview is low and higher and on and on and on. However, non-Western culture have more supernaturalistic and more holistic view of universe. So the Indian people had this kind of uh, idea. And then he talked about ontological view, creation as an ontological state. Page 70. Exposure to light fundamentally changed people's ontological status. The story of how the sun raven captured the day told how they stole the light from its master, guardian. But the story intended to show how the world was created. Light was presented as an essence of creation. Therefore, the story was not about getting the physical element, but about ontological status. So it's not physical light, but it is the status. Right? And, but, but interestingly, my friend correctly points out, but even this rendering of the story was very westernization product. Page 71, he writes, in the beginning, borrowed expression, the English version of the origin myth in the study opens with word beginning, which allude to suspicion of Western form. Let me read that again. They had no light in the beginning, right? How does Genesis begin? How does the Gospel of John begins? In the beginning was the Word, where was God? In the beginning, God created, let there be light. I mean, that's the creation, creation narrative. Remember I told you that Christian narrative is, let there be light and God created something out of nothing, out of vacuum, God created light. And then Cambodian philosopher rightly challenged that and said, well, if so on, nothing is always something. How can something be created out of vacuum? We don't have issues with Christian narratives. We have issues with philosophical misunderstanding of what nothing is. So in the same way, but David correctly points out that, well, in the beginning, the whole begin, it's the, let me just read. There is neither self-standing word for beginning in the ta supata their language, not any specific ta not supata or matching the meaning of English word beginning found in the in their text. Therefore, the term in the beginning was not initially found in their language or concept. 
is the West influence of Westernization. Wow, that's pretty profound, right? And that's what makes this book scholarly. And I was quite impressed. Right? Moreover, the absence of the word beginning in the New Chanu language suggests that there was conceptual disparity of time between Western and indigenous cultures. And furthermore, the idea of God. In the stories, the myth talk about chief, the old man, gray eagle, or mean old chief. <laughs> Talks about God as great, great, great grandfather, three generations. But it seems to be pretty similar to Chinese culture, especially Kung Fu. In the Kung Fu, the martial art world, as told by my father-in-law who was a grandmaster of Taekwondo 10th degree. He said that I like the way the Chinese identify their martial art versus Taekwondo. Taekwondo is black belt, blah, blah, blah. What is black belt? It's, it's very abstract. There's no relational connection because you could get black belt from some cheap dojang and, you know, corrupted dojang and then you could, I could get black belt in a year by paying enough money now. It's nonsense. Black belt means nothing now. But Kung Fu world in Chinese, they said, my masters, 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 Kung Fu, I inherited. And that's what I've been practicing for 37 years. That's how they would introduce their Kung Fu. Their Kung Fu, Kung Fu means study in Chinese. So I've been studying this martial art from the root of my great, great grandfather, great grandfather and grandfather. That's my Kung Fu. So in a way, uh, the idea of God to them is like Bible, Old Testament. God is what? God is father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So there is some correlation into that. And then there is an impartation of God's essence of being a human. In Trinitarian theology, the fatherhood of God and the sonship of Jesus was upheld. In the fundamental idea of New Testament, the it's the elenkos or the, the emptying of self that God takes up clothes of deity and steps into humanity. This is where they drink the little tea that becomes impregnated and son of the raven becomes son of the chief the, through daughter. So that's the kind of imagery, right? And so in a way, uh, the son of Raven as an archetype of Christ. And he says something very profound here. 100, page 4. Uh, Levi Strauss, as the central figure in the structuralist school of thought, studied the underlying pattern of thought in all forms of human activity and argued that savage mind had the same structure as a civilized mind, that all human characters were the same everywhere. So humanization of deity is similar and we find that also in the mythology and we find that in the bible the typical origin myth described the creation nature terrain people plants and animals however new channel story present a lengthy description advent of the light but no description how physical world came to be so they are dealing their creation narrative is for you know, a philosophical and talks about light and how light can change everything is their turn of creation story. I thought that was like, wow, that's pretty profound. In conclusion, he writes, the story of Son of Raven captures a day in original myth of new channel people around the creation of universe. This oral tradition, storytelling is an essential way in which the new channel understand their culture, their history and their creation. The son of Raven, their cultural hero, served as an archetype of human existence instead of being their savior. Okay, this is a little different because uh, uh, the evangelicals and Christians of the last 2000 years has been reading the Bible in the motif of salvation. But no, their 
Son of Raven is not a savior per se. Neither the storyteller nor the audience has difficulty with the appearance of physical being in the process of creation of physical universe. It is possible indication that new channel concept of time dissipated the logic sequence of the creation. However, unlike the Greek and other mythologies of the polyth polytheistic, polytheistic priest created universe, as much like the creation story of the Old Testament, new channel perceive that there is Nas, they or God. Christianity as a dominant cultural form had a major influence in their culture. A few findings cultural motive emerge in the story. Community was there from the beginning because of the new channel is the natural order of exist existence. The value of member of communities never overlooked as every part, everyone participate with individual talents. The task of capturing the day light could not have been achieved without the team effort of community. Wow. Finally, they told the story in the long winter nights during the rainy season when all the ocean activities were quietened as the dark breaks into the day morning, ravens were swarming in the beaches, pecking the roof of the houses and going about finding their food. The world uh, new channel imagined was the world that had dark side that was illumined by the light. They imagined the world that consists of personal engagement and interaction with mutuality with other and with the different side of the world that had the light. Wow, what a beautiful poetic end. And I said, man, it's worth 25 bucks, man. Wow, it's very scholarly book done like a po poetry. Bravo, my friend, job well done. It's great. And especially I really love the way that he did index at the end because there's that's really helpful if you are just reading this without any computer. And there's just a few other items, but overall, I said, man, this is great. Great stuff. I, I, I really thought it was great. And I understood why he wrote in the introduction. He writes, the primary aim of this book was to study new channel origin myth and discover the continuing cultural religious ideas stored in New Channel's myth of origin. He says that my specifically study explored that philosophical idea of New Channel thoughts, examining how their view of God, their creator, compared with that of their religion. This was the key question he asked. How can religious idea embedded in New Channel culture give an understanding of Christianity to New Channel person? What does their salvation look like? And not looking at from salvation-based narratives. And I think he succeeded. I look forward to his next book. Uh, he's doing five book series of his PhD. This is his second book, third, fourth, fifth book. Hopefully it, when he comes, I'll do a book report on that. Well, especially uh, I wanna do uh, philosophy debate about this with my RUPP, Royal University of Phnom Penh students. I hope you are listening to it. Uh, and think about that. How is it different? How is absence of darkness is not light? So if absence of something is not nothing, uh, how would Cambodian creation narratives since a Cambodian is a Buddhist and Buddhists believe in godless religion. Buddha never claimed to be God. So you believe in godless religion. So now let's assume that if God did create the universe and it's more plausible to believe that there was a creator than not none, then what does that mean uh, for you? How do you make, Mata Hoshe, what do you think? Talk to me about how this would mean and, and for you to understand creation narrative as come on. All right. Okay, man, Lord bless you. I hope uh, this was helpful. Let's, I wanna say goodbye to you and meet me at next book talk.